Okay, so let's start. So what happened mean yesterday that we uh, scrolled off a little bit. So what we we'll do is uh, I said that today we'll discuss uh, contractor inequality, uh, how to optimize your uh, non-linear equation of inequality. But since we are already uh, doing linear, and I was there in uh, the session, so you guys have uh, some issues with uh, simplex method. So I'll quickly wind up what uh, I left in half in last uh, last week. That is the solving uh, optimization uh, uh, with equality constraint, whether uh, linear or non-linear. So I'll finish that. Then we'll do a simplex uh, method example in Excel sheet. So since uh, today it's today. Also, my tab is not. Uh, I didn't get my tab, so I I will suggest that you guys also open the Excel sheet as I have opened. So we'll make here an Excel sheet, uh, a, a table, and then we'll do the row operations, and then we'll keep on modifying. And here we we'll it. We'll see how to get the, get to the solution, and then in the end we'll uh, do the Google sheet solver also. Yeah. So because uh, I believe that uh, in my bit at least I didn't have an estimate. Microsoft Excel. So this Google Sheet solver, if you download, you can do it in Google Sheet. This doesn't require any description of you. So let's quickly we will finish the Lagrange equation. So this, uh, before I do that, uh, can anyone tell me when uh, from last week, when do we call a matrix positive definite? So it's uh, it's outside this slide. So it's just a general question. When do we call a matrix? Uh, Positive definite matrix. That, yeah. So that uh, and uh, when it is positive definite, then it is uh, a convex problem and a minima problem. So if you, uh, you guys have remembered that, then uh, we, uh, we can finish this quickly. So yeah. So here's the thing: we had an uh, optimization with inequality uh, with uh, some constraint because. Uh, in real life, there will always be a constraint. That's why I explained the example of designing a water tank, cylindrical water tank with volume, fixed volume D, but you need to minimize the surface area. So one of the examples. And then we said that to solve this, what we have to do, right? So we will have a function fx that will be an objective function. We have to minimize that. It will be a function of some n variables, let's say x1 to xn. And there will be, let's say, m. Uh, equality constraints. So to do that, uh, what we have to do is we have to introduce Lagrangian multipliers, m Lagrangian multipliers. We will multiply each of the constraints with that multiplier and add them to the objective function. So and then we will get our Lagrange equation. So it will look like this. So since we had uh, uh, m constraints, so we have a lambda one to lambda m Lagrange multipliers, and now this is a new equation that we have. Got. Now uh, the unknowns now are uh, we already had uh, n unknowns. Now we have added m more unknowns. So the total number of unknowns is n plus n. Now how do we solve this with? Uh, you know, how do we get these values from this this equation? So we solve them uh, a simple uh, same principle as we get the stationary point. We just uh, we just do the first derivative. With respect to x n times, and then first derivative with respect to lambda, lambda one, lambda two, lambda n, m times, and then we solve them to get the x and lambda. So, yeah. So this is the step one. We calculate the stationary points. So we uh, then uh, I showed this example. So let's try to do with this example. Uh, we have optimization function f x. So okay. So I'm sorry if you are feeling that I'm going too fast because uh, the thing that will help you at this stage of the assignment will be the simplex method, but I don't also want to leave this in half. So uh, you can just, whenever you are watching on YouTube, you can slow down or pause and watch it. Uh, so uh, I apologize for that. So this function uh, we have been given, we have to find out whether it is maxima or minima when it is subject to this particular constraint. So we have x and y, two variables, and one constraint. So basically, we have a we have to make a Lagrange function. So Lagrange function will have only one lambda because we have only one constant. So this is our Lagrange function. 
we added uh, the constraint equality constraint to the level balance function after multiplying it with lambda and to find out the stationary uh, values of x y and lambda we did the partial first order differential of this Lagrange function with respect to x y and lambda and we got these three equations now uh, we can solve these three equations by uh, you know, simple method or uh, using rho equilon transformation and uh, we can get the value of x y lambda now, what i have done uh, i had done last time was i didn't show this but uh, this was in the uh, last time slide was uh, I solved it using a rho equilon reduction. So does everyone know what is uh, rho equilon transformation, rho equilon reduction? Or, uh, oh, okay. So is everyone familiar with that? Okay, so I will very quickly uh, tell you what it is. So you have this uh, set of equations. One, two, three equations, one, two, three values. Now, uh, what we, we can write this in the matrix form as I have written here Ax is equal to B, where A is a matrix of coefficients, X is a matrix of variables, and B is a matrix of vector of constants. So, when we write this, uh, basically the rho equilion form of a particular matrix is when you make these lower diagonal elements zero. So we can do that by doing certain transform, uh, like certain row operations. So let's say we have initially one one zero. Now I want to make uh, these things zero. What happens to this? I don't. Uh, we don't interfere with this, but I want to make these two zero. So I do this particular transformation as R three. This row three is equal to six times row three plus R. So when I do that, it is going to be six minus six and plus of minus is minus. So 6 minus 6 0, 6 minus 6 0, and then uh, z, uh, 0 plus 1, 1. So we have this, and uh, we get this particular new one. Now, in rho equilion form, the correct rho equilion form actually, these uh, diagonal elements have to be 1. So uh, luckily we got a here 1, but if it was not 1, we would have had to uh, do the divide uh, this particular row by this whatever value was here. So you can see uh, this in the second row. So we have to again make the, this element of the second row to zero. So we just basically so we see what we can do to make it zero. We can just subtract the first row from the second row. So that's what we do, R2 minus R1, and this becomes zero. Luckily, our this also becomes zero. That will not always be the case, but we don't even care about that. Well. We care about the lower diagonal elements only. Those that are these three. Okay. So we made first row elements, lower diagonal element 0. Then we made this particular element 0. Luckily, this one also became 0, we don't care. But here we have uh, a value which is not 1. So we'll divide this particular row 2 by minus 4 and make it 1. Okay, and then uh, doing this, we have now the value of. Uh, you can actually write uh, this in back to the equation form also, right? So, uh, how will you say this in equation form? Can anyone tell me? So, here you uh, see, uh, this, this is now the coefficient and this is now the variable. And I saw the cons constant uh, vector. That's what we did. We joined them and made a new matrix, right? So if you want to write it, write it as an equation, you just put this thing here and replace this matrix with this particular new matrix that we have gotten. So what we will have, let's let's took uh, let's take only the lower one, lower one, last. One. So it will be zero into x, zero into y, and one into lambda is equal to twenty three. So lambda value is twenty three. And luckily, we see uh, now we learn no lambda. We can use the lambda uh, if there was a coefficient here to get the value of y, and we get the y value of minus one meter because directly, simply again here zero into x, one into y, zero into lambda is equal to minus one. Meter. And when we have x and lambda, uh, this thing, when we have uh, lambda and y, we can simply calculate the value. So this was the stationary form. Now we want to know whether the 
these stationary points uh, correspond to a maxima or minima, convex or convex. So for that we need a modified Gaussian matrix. Okay, so let's see how do we make a modified Gaussian matrix. Okay, don't don't be scared. <laughs> I, I know this previous looked a little bit intimidating, but don't be scared. It's, uh, I will ex try to explain it as nicely as possible. So one thing to note here is uh, this function actually f has to be replaced with l, the Lagrange function that we have. So let me just show you. This is the function that uh, by mistake I wrote there f. So you have to replace this particular f everywhere with this l. So how do we get, so let's see how do we get this particular red, red highlighted elements in this matrix. Uh, so first we arrange the first derivative of this Lagrange multiplier. Again here instead of f you note it that it is l. So it will be dl by dx1, dl by dx2 and so on for the variables, the variables that we wanted actually. When you have arranged them in a row form like this, then simply you uh, you could do the partial derivative of this first element starting from x1 to xn. So here, so this is what uh, this is what we have, and then we, there are, we do the derivation with x1, we do the derivation with x2, and so on till xn, and then we uh, put these values into the row. Similarly, we do the same thing for the uh, second also, dl uh, do l by do x2. And you, uh, you do the derivation with respect to x1, x2, xn for this same thing, and then you have. So on you make your, uh, this the first double derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to the variables originally x1 to x2. So this particular thing is was our original Bayesian matrix structure. The only things that have changed are these things. So how do we get them? So it's also uh, straightforward. What you do is you do the derivative of your uh, Lagrange function with this, with this Lagrange multiplier. So since we, uh, let's say we have M constraints and when you do the derivative of this Lagrange uh, function with each of these uh, M Lagrange multipliers, you will, you will get to see that the resultant is the constraint itself, is the equality constraint itself. So then you write these equality constraints in a row uh, vector, so G1, G2, Gm, and then again you do the same thing, that is you derive, uh, do the derivation of each of these uh, elements with respect to x1, x2, and till xn, and then you put the values in this particular column. And uh, once we have this, then this particular red highlighted is just simply the transpose of them. So let's say you have this particular, you have calculated for all the m constraints, what is the derivative, the double derivative with respect to this x1. And you just simply take this row and put it into this particular column. And similarly, you take this one and put it into the second column and so on till x1. And when you do that, what you will notice is you have uh, n elements where you have the deriv first derivative with x and you have m elements where you have uh, first derivative with the lambda. So this is actually a n plus m uh, square matrix of Lagrange uh, of the Lagrange equation and these elements will be zero. So the rest of the elements we don't care about them, they will be zero. Yeah, so let's, uh, we will see basically with the example that we had. So we had that first derivative with respect to x1 was this, with respect to y was this, and with respect to the Lagrange multiplier is this. So to get the elements that I had highlighted in red, we will just write uh, the first day partial derivative of this Lagrange with respect to x here, and for that uh, y we have written here, and then we systematically do the derivative with respect to x, so it will be minus x with respect to y, it will be minus x. And for this equation also, with respect to x, it is minus x. And with respect to y, it is minus x. Now, now that we have this, we will go for the uh, modified part. So then we wrote what is the partial derivative of L with this uh, Lagrange. So it will be x plus y minus one. And when you look at it, it is actually the equality constraint. So when we write this, then again, as I said, we do the derivative with respect to x, so it will be 1, 
with, with respect to y, it will be one. And uh, then I said that uh, when we have this particular thing, then getting the uh, row below this Hegian matrix is just a transpose. So one one it's a column here, so it will become a row here. So basically, this is our uh, modified Hegian matrix. And if we had a, another constraint, then you would have written it here, and then done the same thing: derivation with x, derivation with y, and uh, done the transpose of here in this, in this particular. Okay. So now uh, we have our uh, Hessian modified Hessian matrix. When we write it into a nice matrix form, it will look like this. And uh, to know to know whether this particular uh, modified Hessian matrix is maxima or minima at uh, the inflection point, what we have to do is we have to subtract the diagonal elements, but not all diagonal elements. Subtract the diagonal elements of the internal n by n uh, Hessian matrix by a constant called epsilon. So what do I mean here is, see, when we made the Hessian matrix, I said that it will be n plus n square matrix. So n is the number of variables. Here we have two x and y, and m is the number of constraints. So n plus n three. So we made a three by three um, modified Hessian matrix. Now to identify whether this particular uh, function is going to be maxima or minima, what we have to do? The internal, the inside Hessian matrix that we had, the two by two, we subtract epsilon from the diagonal elements of this particular matrix. And then we put the determinant of this particular uh, this matrix, modify uh, this new matrix to zero, and we get the value of epsilon. So when we do that, so here you see that this element is left because we have to subtract epsilon from only internal two by two. So when we do uh, this particular solution, we get the epsilon value as minus. Two. So here there will be two values of epsilon, both have come to minus. Two. And use the same. We use the same principle as uh, eigenvalue that whenever all the epsilon is positive, then f x is uh, going to be minima at the stationary point. Whenever all of them are negative, f x is going to be maxima at the stationary point. Some are positive, some are negative. Then uh, it is neither maxima nor negative. So at this particular thing, we have all the values as negative. So f x is going to be maxima at the inflection point, eleven by two and minus one. So uh, sorry for going so fast. Actually, so this will uh, you can watch it later whenever this topic comes into the course. But I just didn't want to leave it at that. Now let's come to the simplex. So I request. So 